Hey Warpugs, so today we're going to check out a Patreon request from Real Gamers MMBR. And I'm going to turn this headlight down a little bit. There we go. Nice little warmer instead of like harsh, bright, stuff like that. But apparently this covers pretty much the history of, well, Halo. I do believe if this is anything I've come to enjoy from Installation 00, this is going to cover Halo. It has been some time since I checked out anything about Halo. But, with all that being said, it's about time I got back into it. It's been a while. It's been a good long while. Guys, be sure to like and subscribe if you haven't already. And also, if uh, you go check out the description below, all of Installation 00's links are going to be in the description. I highly recommend it. Let's get back into it. Let's go. We're going to go with the Interpl Interplanetary Wars, lore and theory. This was requested by Real Gamers MBR. I don't know if I mentioned that because I'm a boomer and I tend to forget things. Let's get into it. When most think about Halo, they think of Spartan 117, the Master True. Chief, tearing through hordes of aliens and saving the galaxy. The Human Covenant War unsurprisingly makes up a significant portion of the narrative that has thus far been told True. in the Halo universe. Halo Infinite is due for release in full this year, and the suggested storyline uh. seems to be moving forward with the Banished, a mercenary organization of alien species, most of which we are familiar with due to their previous involvement with the Covenant. But many often forget that the vast majority of the story we have experienced started in the final year of the Human Covenant War in 2552 mm -hmm. and up to 2558 at the latest, at least as far as the games are concerned. But there is a rich history of narrative in the books that cover events as far back as 2511. Halo also shares a common history with our real world. By definition, you exist in one form or another in the Halo universe back in 2021. The same way that you exist in the 40k universe right now in M3. So the next big question is, is there any law on what happens from now, the year 2021, up to the events we've seen in Halo? Okay, so I can already tell I'm really going to enjoy this because I love stuff like this where it basically expands and teaches you the backstory of a potential future for humanity. I absolutely love this stuff. I'm really psyched right now. Let's get into it. In short, yes. Yes, there is. The information available about this period of time can be found in the rise of humanity in the book Halo Mythos, the Halo Encyclopedia, and Halopedia. So let's take a look at just what happens between now and the beginning of the Human Covenant War in 2525. Okay. Outstanding intro. I like that. I really do like that. I really like that intro. That's After a nice. eons spent trapped on their homeworld due to the forced devolution at the hands of the foreigners, 20th century humanity finally escaped Earth's atmosphere once again to ascend into the inky depths of space. The first modern humans travelled to the lower reaches of Earth's orbit in 1961, and then in 1969 humans set foot on Luna for the first time in a millennia. Other bodies in the solar system followed throughout the 21st and 22nd century. By 2080, Earth's nations had put together joint efforts to colonise Luna, Mars, and a handful of other sites in the system, including various asteroids. Despite the daunting technological challenge of embedding sustainable populations on these worlds, new scientific innovations eventually made it a reality, and the interplanetary colonies saw growth and prosperity during these early years. Global wars on Earth shattered the power of old nation-states 
even as virulent new philosophies spread among the solar colonies. Not everyone embraced relative peace under the aegis of the United Nations, and new factions with militant ideologies exacerbated political and economical fracture lines to the breaking point. In the mid 22nd century, two militant movements emerged among Earth's colonies, dramatically altering the political landscape. The emergence of both was due in part to overpopulation and unrest on Earth itself, okay. those belonging to the first originating in Mars's mining city of Oinotria were known as the Koslovics. Koslovics. They were named for the miner turned activist Vladimir Koslov. And oh, this is gonna be brilliant. And his family. The neo communist Koslovic miners That's rallied against what they saw as financial exploitation by the corporations which dominated the colony. They looked back on the Soviet Union of the 20th century with nostalgia and romanticized state control over industry seeking the elimination of corporate and capitalist influence from societal structures. After the violent takeover of three major mining facilities, the Koslovics were deemed terrorists by the United Nations. Their ideas however gained momentum across Mars and rural parts of Luna among people who felt government sponsored companies were violating colonists rights. Huh. Though the Koslovics did have some supporters on Earth, they operated primarily on orbital facilities, the aforementioned colonies and parts of the Jovian system. The other hostile ideology embodied by the Freedom Movement grew out of the major city of Catreus on Europa and received backing from a group of corporate interests in the unified German Republic which had become frequent targets of Koslovic workers' crusades. Though oh. the word Frieden in German means peace, the neo-fascist Friedens formed largely in response to Koslovic elements in the Jovian colonies and quickly turned to violence. In 2158, Friedens targeted a United Nations embassy in the European city of Thynia and leveled the structure with military grade explosives. Okay. As with the Koslovics, the United Nations branded them terrorists as well and then promptly dispatched UN colonial advisors to Io, another Jovian moon. There, the UN advisors were tasked with helping to organize police efforts. Okay. In the years that followed, few colonists remained neutral as both the Freedens and the Koslovics spread their influence among humanity's interplanetary colonies, with the United Nations lacking the military capability to prevent such actions. In an open act of rebellion against the United Nations, the Freedens attacked the colonial advisors on Io in 2160. The attack on the colonial advisors led to three months of fighting between the Koslovics and Frieden's forces from March to June 2160, sparking the Jovian Moons campaign. Huh. The campaign would be fought among Jupiter's moons. The United Nations attempted to pacify the situation but with no success. To strengthen their efforts, the United Nations called upon national governments of Earth to utilize their own militaries and aid in the campaign. I can only picture how well this would have gone considering the two the two types of factions at war. You had fascists and you had communists. Oh joy. Don't you just f absolutely love it when it boils down to just that. The distributed nature of their forces led to disorder amongst the ranks of the Earth militaries. The death toll among all sides was substantial. Oh wow. The Jovian Moons campaign was one of the bloodiest conflicts that had ever taken place within the Sol system. The conflict served to strengthen the anti-government and anti-corporate sentiment growing among colonists. The campaign led to mass militarization among Earth's nations, many of which sponsored colonies within the system as they began fighting proxy wars off-planet. With the campaign's end, conflict within the Sol system ceased for several months, with some speculating that the worst had passed. Yeah. However, a series of bombings in February 2162 would spark the Rainforest Wars, a 19-month conflict that spread across South America and reignited violence throughout the Sol system. Huh. The Jovian Moons campaign would be remembered as the conflict that would foreshadow the impending 
interplanetary war. Okay. In 2162, following the Jovian Moons campaign, armed conflict ripped through South America as Koslovic, Frieden, and UN forces clashed over ideological differences. Additional guerrilla attacks took place across Earth on military and non-military targets, along with several concurrent off-planet skirmishes. The more, like, we need a better school of thought than what has been given to us in the last 150 years. We need much better schools of thought at this point. Because, like, no, nothing is working anymore, it seems. Nothing is working for everyone. In the latter stages of the wars, neo freedonists emerged as an offshoot of the freedom movement willing to negotiate with the United Nations. Their disagreements with the Mayline Freedons led to the Battle of Delambre on Luna, in which the two factions engaged one another. The Rainforest Wars also sparked additional conflicts off-planet, such as the Mars Campaign three months later. The conflict brought a great deal of suffering to the people of Earth and caused an enormous famine. The wars inspired some of the 22nd century's most famous literature. A Soldier's Tale, Rainforest Wars was written about this event by Jeremiah Mendez and was considered a military classic in the 26th century. Okay. This book is a favourite of CPO Franklin Mendez. Huh. Two of Admiral Preston Cole's great-grandfathers on his mother's side served in the Rainforest Wars. One did not survive. The other, Captain Oliver Franks, received the Bronze Star. The Mars Campaign. Now. In November 2163, the Freedon suffered a critical loss, as their leader, Nadja Milka, was assassinated on her way to a command centre in the European city of Pelagon. This enraged the Freedons, and in December they retaliated with nearly all the military assets at their disposal. A large-scale campaign against Argaia Planitia, the hub of Koslovic activity thanks largely to its shipbuilding plants on Mars, obliterated the city within hours. More fighting occurred during the weeks that followed, as Koslovics scattered into the city's outskirts, by January 2164, the conflicts historically known as the Interplanetary Wars had officially begun. Oh. The aforementioned composite UN force, which would later be called the United Nations Space Command, was deployed to the Martian Territory's most combat-intensive area in huh. July. The resulting battle on Mars lasted two full years, as the United Nations bombed Koslovic remnants, stamping out any Martian opposition. It was this campaign that not only made it the first successful UN strike against Koslovic forces, but were also the first extraterrestrial deployments of UNSC Marines as well. Okay. Thanks to the Marines' success, actions that favoured large contingents of ground assaults and shipboarding manoeuvres became part of the UN forces' standard strategy from that point onward. Okay. Despite the vast death toll, there was little concern on Earth about the ethics of the strikes. Most felt that they were justified as a way to prevent the violence from spreading to their own soil. Okay. Recruitment drives and propaganda tactics strongly bolstered the UNSC during this time. The interplanetary war was, in many ways, the culmination of a pattern of massive build-ups exhibited by UN-sponsored military forces which had preceded it. I gotta tell you, pelicans, pelicans look awesome, okay? I'm just saying. It is, if I was, to, I always like the dropship from Aliens. I like this one better as a troop carrier. I really, really do. It just looks like something we'd have as a troop carrier in the future. We actually have the technology to make something very similar to a pelican, which is awesome. Although the Koslovic suffered extensive losses in the early parts of the Martian assault, they continued to thrive on Luna and at isolated points on Earth. In August 2167, however, Vladimir Koslov and his family were killed in a bombing near Lake Autolycus on Luna. While the UNSC denied involvement, many believed that the Freedons were not capable of carrying out such an attack. Whatever the cause, this act severed the head of the Koslovic movement. 
despite some difficulty on the UNSC's part, Europa, Io, Ganymede, and Callisto all saw large-scale invasions by the UNSC Marine Corps, resulting in the destruction of hundreds of Freedon bases and weapon caches. Ah. The last of the Freedons fought savagely under Oscar Bauer, nephew of Naja Milka. But by mid-2169, little remained of their movement. The UNSC defeated Koslovic and Freedon forces on Earth and then methodically eradicated their remnants throughout the system in a series of bushfire conflicts. Before long, the vast vestiges of both were apprehended by the UNSC. The United Nations penned the Callisto Treaty, a ceasefire agreement born out of fear and simple practicality that gave the UNSC complete military and police jurisdiction in all colonial territories. Hurrah! The treaty was signed by representatives of all three factions in March 2170 on the Jovian moon of Callisto. Hmm basing its core ethos on a strategy that harkened back to the United States of America, the technocrats in the UN used its increased power to effectively take charge of Earth's remaining national governments. The UNSC became the single organizing independent force in control of the combined military hierarchy of humanity. And that's how you make a dictatorship out of nowhere. In all honesty, that's how you make a dictatorship out of nowhere. The pr only problem I have with this is any single person that is able to wield this much power, it has a habit of corrupting them. So, I, I there's not much that I know about the governmental structure in Halo for the humans. It's going to be interesting to see how this pans out. With this, a single authority came into existence called the United Earth Government. This would be the seat of power and governance for all of Earth's colonies henceforth. Mm -hmm. The United Earth Government was constituted as humanity's governing body by the UN in the immediate wake of the conflict in 2170 with the UNSC serving as its subordinate military branch. The aftermath of the interplanetary war left the United Earth Government with a different threat, overpopulation and a massive military with no enemy to fight. Yay! The post-war period saw massive growths in population on Earth and her colonies, as well as increasing famine among the populace bred from the rainforest wars. These situations threatened to destabilize the economy. However, in April 2291, a team of researchers, physicists, and mathematicians, led by doctors Wallace Fujikawa and Tobias Fleming Shaw, saw the invention of the Shaw Fujikawa Translite Engine, a device that allowed ships to travel into slipstream space Very nice. to traverse interstellar distances in proportionally short amounts of time. In 2310, the United Earth Government unveiled their first line of colony ships, designed to bring rigorously tested, highly qualified colonists and military personnel to settle nearby worlds. In theory, only This is always the part that gets to me. You always want everything to go right in this particular set of circumstances. One day, I hope humanity does go to the stars. I really do. I just don't know what we're going to be when we get there. I don't know what we're going to be like when we get there. I don't know how we're going to react when we get there. But... God, I'd love to see it one day. Even though I know it's never going to happen in my lifetime. Only the best qualified citizens and soldiers were allowed to colonize humanity's newest colonies, leading to the formation of the inner colonies. It was at this time that the Colonial Administration Authority was established by the United Earth Government as an agency tasked with the governing of human colonies and the direction of further colonization efforts. Mm. The Colonial Military Administration was formed alongside the CAA to serve as the military body responsible for protecting the UEG's extrasolar colonies, while the United Nations Space Command largely kept their operations confined to the Sol system. The Colonial Administration Authority proceeded to spend the upcoming decades preparing and organizing for the inevitable exodus that would occur. Mm -hmm. 
The Domus Diaspora officially began on January the 1st, 2362, when the Odyssey, CAA First Reverie, and a fleet of nearly 100 other colony ships were launched from mooring platforms orbiting Luna to colonize the Epsilon Eridni system. Despite okay. early successes for the first decades of the Domus Diaspora, colonization efforts faced significant challenges in marshalling political and economical support. Mm. The Epsilon Eridni system, home to an improbably high number of worlds within the habitable zone of the system's host star, became a prime candidate for colonization efforts and succeeded in bringing more attention to colonization efforts. The first colonies formed in the Domus Diaspora were established on verdant worlds and above resource-rich moons. As early terraforming efforts resulted in lengthy processes depending on the conditions of the world, already habitable worlds, however rare, were preferred by the United Earth Government expansion effort. No doubt there. I mean, that's the first step of Solaris world. Find the habitable worlds and colonize them. Habitable worlds that could be quickly reached through slipspace soon housed sprawling cities and orbital factories connected through trade and the influence of massive interstellar corporations. These colonization successes and improvements in slipspace navigation spurred further exploration increasingly distant from Sol. For a time, much of the United Earth Government's resources were directed towards further colonial expansion. By 2390, the inner colonies were formally established, consisting of 210 worlds in various stages of terraforming. The okay. population burden across human space had largely stabilized in the Domus Diaspora. In subsequent years, the inner colonies exponentially grew and prospered drawing in investment and building infrastructure extensive enough to become self-sufficient and send their surpluses back to Earth. Okay, that Meanwhile, works. smaller colonies and outposts of the greater human civilization spread ever outward along slipspace routes from this developed and tightly controlled zone to become the outer colonies. By the beginning of the 25th century, humanity had colonized over 800 colonies existing on planets, moons, asteroids, mining facilities, and relay stations. Okay. The inner colonies consisted of strong, densely populated worlds located close to Earth via slipspace, ranging from prominent military and commercial centers such as Reach and Tribute, to comparatively smaller colonies such as Actium, Ballast, Cairo, Lytton, Mirrodin, and New Carthage. Many of the outer colonies served as agricultural or mining worlds providing resources for the inner colonies and industrial outer colonies like Meridian. The inner colonies became the political and economical centre for the United Earth Government Makes as they sense. began to rely on the outer colonies for natural resources. Meanwhile, the United Nations Space Command began to expand its domain to the inner colonies making Earth and reach the centres of its power while pushing the colonial military administration to the outer colonies. Ah. Civil unrest is due to Despite follow. Despite the prosperity and unprecedented growth and development humanity experienced during this time, tensions soon rose on mm -hmm. some of the more remote colonies that saw independence from the United Earth Government. From 2475 to 2483, a number of civilian uprisings occurred throughout human space. It's not going to be surprising. They would probably see the inner colonies as basically taking everything for them to feed their growth. And the outer colonies would be feeling like they had been abandoned to starve over a period of time. I'm guessing that's how all this starts. The colonial military administration responded swiftly and severely. Though the organization's heavy-handed tactics only served to increase resistance. Soon, Many citizens on outer colonies and even the inner colonies began questioning the often draconian measures used by the CMA and the UNSC to keep colonies in line. Mm -hmm. Dictatorship is a dictatorship. That's basically what it gave birth to. Seeking sovereignty on the behalf of a dozen worlds, the newly established Sectionist Union and People's Occupation submitted formal requests to the United Earth Government demanding independence. As three requests were left denied, tensions began to rise amongst the outer colonies. These tensions eventually erupted into the insurrection, a civil war that engulfed numerous colonies. 
As these sentiments spread, even some scattered elements of the CMA became increasingly sympathetic to the rebels, eventually providing them with information, funding, and equipment. The involvement of these sects of the CMA with the rebels went public in 2497, hmm. leading to the organization's gradual dismantling and its supplantment by the UNSC as the primary military force in the colonies. In 2491, Dr. Elias Carver presented a set of theories known as the Carver Findings to the UNSC High Command. According to a projection algorithm devised by Dr. Carver, social order in the outer colonies would break down completely in the near future. To stabilize the colonies, Carver recommended a swift and extensive military action on the part of the UNSC. Of course. Carver's critics asserted that the situation between the core worlds and the outer colonies could be stabilized through diplomacy over enough time. Hmm. However, the UNSC military adopted the Carver findings as their standard model for the years to come, and sought to curb any major unrest with military intervention. In oh, there's a problem with that. I really now, after hearing what he just said, I can't see the, the Earth government as anything other than tyrannical at this point. It has become very tyrannical. In the same year, the UNSC resurrected the mothballed Orion project, creating the first generation of super soldiers designed to surgically remove rebel leadership. Carver's proposal also informed the creation of the subsequent Spartan II program, although by the time of its creation the predicted scenario was even bleaker, yeah. an endless, apocalyptic civil war between the inner and outer colonies. Perhaps the most notorious instance of the brutal and heavy-handed approach the UNSC and CMA took to quelling rebellions in the late 25th century was that of Far Isle. Okay. In 2492, in the midst of the rising tensions throughout the colonies, Far Isle was among the first of the colonies to go into full-scale revolt. Despite their best efforts, the UNSC were unable to contain the rebellion and as a result, they resorted to nuclear weaponry, oh, raising the entire colony and leaving no survivors from the populace. Totally got your best interests at heart, though. There's no reason to rebel. They subsequently declared Code Bandersnatch, indicating a major radiological or energy-based disaster. Although not usually acknowledged as the inciting incident of the insurrection, the destruction of Far Isle caused multiple larger rebellions elsewhere, and was considered a significant factor in motivating the insurrection as a whole. Mm -hmm. Far Isle remained a driving force for the hatred that many individuals bore for the UNSC and UEG even as late as 2553. It really doesn't surprise me at this point. It sounds like they were just being dicks. It utterly, like, and I don't mind if it sounds kind of off to some people. What it sounds like is the UNSC were a bunch of assholes. In staunchly independent colonies such as Venezia. After hearing the build-up to this, um, now I know that some of this was told to me before, but what it sounds like to me was the outer colonies were basically, they felt put upon by the inner colonies completely. It doesn't surprise me in the slightest that there would be an organized rebellion. And it's kind of the way that we actually do things today um, in a lot of ways. The more people from less populated areas feel put upon by people from highly populated areas. It is the way, it, it is kind of that way um, that people feel like that. But in this particular instance, it just looks like the inner colonies had the full backing of the only competent military force that was there. So, I mean, the outer colonies might very well have felt completely and totally justified in rebelling. And who's to say they were wrong? I mean... Damn. Anyhow, let's go. The Callisto Incident was a pivotal event which is often considered to have started the insurrection, widening the scope of the conflict from occasional disparate colonial rebellions into hostilities on a larger scale. Hmm. 
The Unasi Callisto, a corvette, was captured by the insurrectionists when boarding merchant vessels, and all UNSC crew aboard it were killed. Ah. In response, the UNSC sent a battle group of three destroyers, the UNSC Jericho, UNSC Buenos Aires, and the UNSC Las Vegas. On March the 2nd, 2494, the battle group eventually found the Callisto in the 26th Draconis system. All of the ships fired six Ares missiles at the Renegade destroyer, however the Callisto managed to avoid destruction by manoeuvring behind an asteroid. Okay. The insurrectionists then detonated a nuke hidden inside the asteroid beforehand, launching the debris towards the UNSC ships. The Buenos Aires was engulfed in the explosion and destroyed, and the other two ships were seriously damaged. Second Lieutenant Preston Cole, as the only living or conscious officer aboard the bridge of the Las Vegas, took control of the vessel. He signalled the Callisto, activating the ship's distress signal, and requested medical aid for the wounded. When the Callisto docked with the Las Vegas in order to take command of the ship, Cole detonated the ship's last Ares missile, which had been planted inside the docking bay. That's called a war crime. Critically damaging the Callisto. Cole then bluffed by opening the empty missile silos on his ship and ordered the Callisto to surrender and allowed Las Vegas' AI to take control. Following the Callisto incident, the insurrection began to spread to the other systems, including the Aridna system which became embroiled in a local insurrection in the same year. I'm not really surprised, that's a fucking war crime. The rebellion was crushed two years later at the cost of four destroyers, mm. though the rebels in the system retreated into the asteroid belt and would continue to operate for several decades onward. As the fighting spread, the outer colonies became a battleground between the UNSC Navy and the rebels' makeshift fleets. In 2501, an insurgent captured UNSC frigate the Bellerophon was pursued for the third time by the UNSC Gorgon, commanded by Preston Cole, into the Theta Ursae Majoris system. After a chase and battle in which the Bellerophon managed to dodge a Mac round using excellent tactics, the Gorgon was contacted by the Bellerophon, now renamed the Bellicose. Okay. A short exchange of taunting messages followed, and then Cole let the Bellicose escape. After laying traps in five systems over the course of three months, Cole had yet to find the captured ship. Several months later, Cole was married to Lyrene Castilla, who was also pregnant. In June of 2503, eight months after Cole's marriage to Castilla, Admiral Harold Stanforth sent Cole a transmission telling him that only uncovered the civilian identity of the captain of the Bellicose, Lyrene Castilla, spying on Cole. Cole went to confirm this and found that Castilla had robbed him of everything, leaving only a printout of the exchange they had between the Bellicose and the Gorgon. In <laughs> January of the next year, four destroyers engaged the Bellicose in the Theta Ursae Majora system and reported that the ship was caught in the gravitational pull of the gas giant and destroyed. Oh my Cole God. faced a court-martial for conspiring with the enemy and giving Castilla knowledge of the UNSC slipspace upgrades. He did a little bit more than conspire and possible execution. However, Harold Stanforth stepped in and vouched for him, and Cole was merely relocated to Earth with a desk job. Oh. The Bellicose survived, however, and remained in the shadows until eventually reappearing with an insurrectionist fleet, dealing the Covenant a crippling blow in the Battle of Serpentis. Hmm. In 2513, the UNSC initiated Operation Trebuchet, one of the largest operations in UNSC history, spanning 10 years and costing hundreds of thousands of lives. The goal was to root out the insurrectionists and impose order in the outer colonies. Fighting broke out in the Eridna system, particularly Eridnus II and the space around it, as rebels supporting the system's breakaway from the UNSC built a small navy of civilian craft and attempted to take over the system. The disorganized Eridnus rebels were eventually brought together by Colonel Robert Watts. The UNSC responded harshly, sending a fleet of destroyers and carriers to the system to combat the rebel fleet. The resulting battle pitted the UNSC against at least 100 smaller rebel craft. The UNSC forces defeated their rebel counterparts with little difficulty. During Didn't the battle, the rebels were routed and the remnants of their fleet fled into the asteroid belt to Eridna Secundus. They would eventually establish a fully functional asteroid base and begin conducting raids again by 2525. Hmm. 
A ground campaign also began on Eridnus II, as units of the 9th Marine Expeditionary Force were sent to the planet in force, hoping to capture leaders of the rebel movement and pacify the population. One of these units, the 1st Battalion of the 21st Marine Division, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Ponder, was involved in a disastrous mission to try and capture a rebel leader, the second in command, in Elysium City, which ended in the leader's family being killed and Ponder wounded and demoted. Oh, God, they're scoring points right now. I'm just saying, they're scoring points for every reason why the insurrectionists would have a reason to rebel. The fighting eventually spread to the Epsilon Eridni system. By 2524, the fighting involved in Operation Trebuchet alone had taken over a million lives, the majority of which being civilians. In that year, a Marine battalion was posted at the Colony World of Tribute, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Aboim, and supported by the Corvette UNSC Bumrush and air support from Hornets. The battalion attempted to put a stop to rebel bomb makers near the city of Kashba. Two special warfare units, led by Staff Sergeants Avery Johnson and Nolan Brine, he knows what the ladies like, were involved in disastrous operations in June. Brian's team was killed during a hostage situation at a Jim Dandy restaurant near Casper City. 38 civilians, 3 marines and 2 rebels were killed in the bombing. Oh Brian and Johnson were pulled from the system and were later sent to harvest. In the year 2525, a Spartan 2 team led by John 117 went on a mission to infiltrate and capture rebel leader Colonel Robert Watts. The Spartans sneaked on board a ship named the Laden and once aboard they located cargo that contained luxury items such as Sweet William cigars and champagne, verifying Watts' presence. After boarding the rebel base, they neutralized the guards in their path and eventually found their way to Watts. They successfully killed his guards and sedated Watts long enough for them to escape. Using explosives, they blasted their way out, killing dozens of civilians, much to the regret of the team. Uh-huh. Following the covenant attack on Harvest, Oh, man. Even the Spartans are accidentally causing war crime. And the onset of the Human Covenant War in 2525, Operation Trebuchet was put on halt by the UNSC. The Office of Naval Intelligence Section 2 sent emissaries with full disclosure on events at harvest to warn outer colony leaders. The UNSC made the offer that they would cease hostilities towards insurrectionists if they worked to bolster their planetary defences and ended their attacks on UNSC ships. The rebels believed it to be a trap and responded with laughter, only to face a harsh dose of reality as the Covenant began laying waste to colony after colony. Uh -huh. As the new threat became apparent, many of the rebels, seeing that the UNSC offered the only real protection against the overwhelming Covenant force, ceased to resist and either submitted to the UNSC's control or hid themselves away from both the UNSC and the Covenant in remote locations such as habitats like the Rubble or outer colony worlds, many of which were eventually glassed. However, yep. not all insurrectionists stopped their attacks against the UNSC and continued their aggression for years after the beginning of the war with the Covenant. An unlikely alliance was forged between the Spartans and insurrectionists during the Battle of Alpha Corvi II, hmm. the two sides having found a common enemy with the Covenant. As the war progressed, insurrectionist activity continued to decrease apart from isolated conflicts such as the insurrections on Mamor and incidents on Harmony and Reach. This was in part due to the common enemy of the Covenant and the desperate situation humanity found itself in, but also the near total decimation of the outer colonies which had served as the rebels' base of operations. Yeah. However, the Typically the glassing of most of your worlds is going to cause kind of a decrease in your activity. Desire for independence continued to linger on many remaining colony worlds. Using the situation to their advantage, entire colonies under insurrectionist control intentionally cut themselves off from the UNSC's communications relay network during the war, anticipating to resume their operations later on. By 2552, Insurrectionist activity on Reach was still common enough for the UNSC to suspect rebel sabotage when a local relay hub went dark, although this turned out to be the work of a Covenant pre-invasion party instead. Mm -hmm. Although insurrectionist activity continued over the Human Covenant War with the last documented conflict as late as 2537, 
the high-profile operations and major battles which characterized the early years all but subsided after the beginning of the Human Covenant War. The Don't vast majority it. of humanity had united under a single banner in order to fight for the survival of the entire species. Even the ununited insurrectionists themselves would fight against the Covenant ultimately helping the war effort. Any engagements between UNSC and the rebels following the Covenant attack appear to have been relatively low-key, often involving covert missions carried out by special operations forces such as Spartans. As a result, the generation that had grown up during the war had no knowledge of the insurrectionist persistence and considered the entire civil war as having occurred long before their time. Hmm. The games Halo Reach, Halo CE, Halo 2, Halo 3, and Halo ODST cover a period of time of less than a year. It's only with Halo 4 and Halo 5 that cover a duration of time significantly after the end of the Human Covenant War. And aside from these, we have huge swathes of books that cover varying time spans in and around these events. And it is strikingly easy to forget that there is a massive and rich history and narrative to the Halo universe, both in and around humanity's rise from now until the 26th century, but also well before back into ancient times, as covered by the Forerunner saga of books, True. and in-game lore established by the Terminals. So while humanity had been fighting for their sheer survival during the Human Covenant War, it was not the first time that we were pushed to such extremes. We risked our own self-annihilation during the interplanetary wars, all the way through the insurrection and up to the beginning of the Human Covenant War, and we became teeteringly close to extinction at the hands of the Forerunners at the end of the Human Forerunner War. Okay. At least three times now in conflicts against other species or ourselves has humanity barely survived complete and utter extinction. And on top of that, humanity has barely survived several extinction-level events here on Earth between 100,000 years ago and now. It says something to the fortitude and resilience of our species, but we're now on the cusp of entering into yet another conflict with both the created and the banished. And while now humanity are in a weakened state, we still do have the super soldiers of the Spartan program at the forefront of our military force to safeguard us through these troubling times, but which was based off of child soldiers. More war crimes. But one has to question: How much longer can our luck hold out? This was really, Thanks for really watching. good. Sticky comments down below. I look forward to what you have to say. I want to give a quick shout out to my patrons and YouTube members: Neek, the silent cartographer. Kyle Stevens and Siphonic Storm, my tier zero transcendence. This was really, really good. Hey, the Lord discussed to insane loves of detail. Hit that subscribe button. Guys, this was really, really good. This was something that, for me, I kind of needed. I kind of needed a timeline to put things into kind of a little bit of perspective when it came to the actual um, beginnings of Halo. Because I knew that the Spartans were meant to fight insurrections, but I didn't know it went that far back. I didn't know it went that far back. Also, another big thing in this was, for me, was just realizing that the UNSC, even though they are the protagonists of the story in the Halo games, weren't really protagonist material overall. They were... You cheer now. I kind of look at it as you cheer for them because they're the best hope humanity has, but they're not the good guys. There aren't any good guys. That makes Halo a little bit better for me. I don't like a series where there's just a, the good guys, everybody has shades of gray. That's the way of life, that's the way of everything. Just how many war crimes did the UNSC commit against the people that were sitting there rebelling against them? And how much damage did they do that caused the own rebellions? Guys, 
thank you for spending this time with me checking out this on the interplanetary wars installation zero zero does an amazing job of presenting this stuff so definitely go by his channel hit the subscribe button for him for more information about this kind of stuff i know you guys want me to check out more halo material um i'm i promise i'm gonna be trying to get to it aside from all that guys halo is the first game in a very long time halo combat evolved was the first game in a very long time that i beat and i did it on this channel um i did halo ce halo 2 3 odst halo 4 i did all that and you guys didn't want me to go further than that because it was just uh it was basically a thing where people were saying i wouldn't like what happened uh, aside from the fact that um, Halo 3 turned out completely different than I thought it was, um, I will always say that Reach was my favorite out of the series. Reach was my absolute favorite out of the series. I did like ODST. Um, guys, Halo has a lot of lore that... I know nothing about and sometimes it is good to get a perspective on things that you didn't have before but now I think I'm gonna wrap up here guys thank you for spending time with me today all of installation zero zero's links are gonna be in the description down below including my own my patreon PayPal everything else like that is down there I'm hoping to have some new artwork up in the back here in a little while We'll see what happens. The wife is insisting that I do something for myself. Hooray. <laughs> Guys, I'll catch you next time.